Hello, I'm Chad, and we are Group 10, and today we will be discussing the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, or ERCOT, which covers about 85% of Texas and is in its own unique situation that is its own separate energy grid disconnected from the rest of the United States. The purpose of this report is due to rising concerns about the environmental effects of fossil fuel, fuel usage, as well as the diminishing of the resources, many states are shifting to a more green energy profile. And the goal of this report is to demonstrate how the Urquhart region can become 99% free of carbon-based energy by the year 2045. And the way we will do that is we will propose three separate energy mixtures to complete this goal. We will analyze these three mixtures, and then we will choose one to be implemented throughout the region. We will provide justifications for the choice, as well as all of the values that we chose. And last, any policy recommendations and changes will be discussed to allow for this mixture to be utilized. Hi, I'm Danny, and I'm going to be going over solar energy. So within the renewable energy field, solar is definitely going to have the front, forefront of everything. Um, given its infinite abundance and the fact that solar prices have drastically dropped within the past decade. It's a really great option as we move to 100% renewable. Texas has the potential to be the largest solar energy producer given its geographical location and size. As you can see on this map, there's a lot of great solar potential right here, as well as compared to other states right there. Um, additionally, by 2045, it's estimated that utility-based solar farms will increase to almost um, 1,600, or, 160,000, excuse me, um, megawatts and domestic based, which are the ones that are on um, residential rooftops to 9,500 megawatts. The optimal areas for these utility um, solar farms too aren't near large populations, which make them really prime areas. The biggest setback with solar is that it's highly dependent on weather as well as the time of day. So that um, coupled with energy storage systems that we'll be talking about later will be where all of our potential lies for Texas. Hello everyone, I'm Malcolm, and I was responsible for wind, hydrogen storage and power, uh, as well as biogas for our project. So let's get started with wind. Uh, wind in the ERCOT region, uh, so Texas currently has 33,133 megawatts of installed wind, uh, the largest capacity of any state within the US. This is because of the large amount of potential Texas has uh, upwards of uh, 1,350 gigawatts of onshore wind generation and 216 gigawatts of offshore generation. So moving on to the technology with wind, uh, current onshore turbines range from two to three megawatts per unit. Those are the new ones, but larger, more powerful turbines are being developed. Uh, so we can expect five megawatt turbines by 2045. Uh, offshore turbines are a different story. Wind is more consistent over water, but it is usually slower, meaning a lower specific power. So larger turbine blades are needed to capture this wind. Uh, the result is blade diameters of over 200 meters, um, but expected capacities per turbine can be expected to be 12 to 15 megawatts. So next we have hydrogen. Hydrogen is a renewable fuel that can either be burned or used in a fuel cell to produce power. Hydrogen can be made from natural gas through steam reforming and other processes, but the current natural gas supply is fracked uh, and therefore is not renewable. So the best alternative to create renewable hydrogen is through electrolysis due to Texas's access to water in the ocean. Uh, once it's produced, this hydrogen can be stored in the current natural gas pipeline and storage systems with some modifications. Uh, hydrogen power will then come from solid oxide fuel cell hybrid systems. Um, so these systems combine a high temperature fuel cell with a gas turbine and a Rankine cycle to produce power and achieve thermal efficiencies of over 75%. And as you see, Texas already has 500 miles of hydrogen pipelines that are currently being used for oil refinement. Uh, but much of the 16, 160,000, I'm sorry, miles of natural gas pipelines would need to be retrofitted in order to accommodate hydrogen. So now we have biogas. So biogas is uh, mainly carbon dioxide and methane, and it is produced from the processing of organic waste, usually from water treatment, landfills, and livestock. Uh, Texas has the second highest potential for biogas in the US at 625,000 tons per year. And once scrubbed the CO2, this methane could be injected directly into the natural gas pipeline system. Uh, and Little side note, adding biogas production is great from a greenhouse gas standpoint because it sequesters methane and then emits CO2 later once the methane is burned. Uh, so CO2 actually has a warming factor of 86 times less 
than methane. So installing this technology in the ERCOT region will reduce its effect on climate change drastically. Hi, my name is Peter Nguyen, and now I shall be discussing nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is energy derived from fission and reaction of radioactive materials, and in particular, uh, uranium fuel rods are typically used. Uh, the reaction produces heat, uh, which then turns water into steam and drives a steam generator, as shown in this figure. The ERCOT region is characterized as having pressurized water reactors, which have two dual cycles. One cycle has water running through the core and heats up. Another cycle that has water running through steam generator, so that they're separated and radioactive materials cannot be contaminated to the steam generator. Uh, currently, ERCOT has around 5,000 megawatts of capacity. However, this can be scaled through import of nuclear fuel and additional construction of reactors. The only restriction really is the high initial capital cost and social opposition against nuclear energy due to environmental concerns. Uh, for our model, we can assume the nuclear energy production to be flat profile, as it is usually consistent aside from start down or shutdown procedures or emergency uh, emergencies. For a battery storage model, uh, we can use excess curtailed power from our model to be diverted and stored in these batteries, in particular lithium ion. Uh, we chose lithium ion as it has near instant discharge time, which can be used to uh, offset peak hours. And we can scale these batteries per unit basis based off of needed megawatt and megawatt hour capacities. The only concern and problem is that uh, current uh, integrated battery systems um, have relatively low capacities. Currently, the max uh, battery capacity is 200 megawatts, and that runs for uh, 12,000 megawatt hours. Um, so a large, large amount of scaling is needed in terms of magnitude for these battery systems to be efficient and useful. Hi, I'm Scott, and I'll be covering geothermal energy in Mixture 3. The idea behind geothermal energy plants is the process of extracting heat created below the surface of the Earth. This heat is then used to power turbines to create energy, giving it the advantage of being incorporatable into existing fossil fuel power plants, given that it has access to a geothermally active area. The ERCOT region does not currently incorporate geothermal energy outside of household and water heating, but research conducted shows that it may have a place in a sustainable electrical grid given the geothermal activity of the area. Some things to take caution of, however, are geothermal overdraft, in which heat is extracted out of the vents faster than can be regenerated, and earthquakes that can be caused from drilling, an issue that is sometimes seen with fracking. These two issues can limit the implementation of this energy source, but is nonetheless an important resource to consider. All right, so moving on to mix one, we wanted to make it relatively similar to what we would expect in the ERCOT region in the future. So a lot of wind and solar with a little bit of everything else. And as you can see, we have about 50% installed wind, 25% installed solar, and 25% uh, everything else. So this mix makes 99% um, zero carbon penetration, and it also achieves 76.37% renewable penetration and a curtailment level of 26.19%. So overall, we think this mix performs relatively well and it suits the needs of the ERCOT region. So the electrolyzers were modeled in a way that they're always on. So they spool up when there's excess and they turn down to a minimum when there's no excess. And uh, to complement that, the fuel cells do the opposite. Um, but this creates this little disparity here where you see that the high levels of, gener uh, of load are actually a lot higher than these low levels. So that is something to be uh, concerned about with this mix. So the overall costs um, of this mix, in order to quantify actually how expensive it was, we created a reference mix called the status quo, where the current um, mix generation capacities were expanded proportionally um, so with current cost projections, mix one is about 1.5 to 1.9 times more expensive to install and is about 2.3 times more expensive to operate and maintain than this status quo mix. So while renewables are currently more expensive to install and operate, the downward tr cost trend will continue and this type of uh, resource mix may end up being less expensive than relying on fossil fuels. And this is going to be mainly due to uh, what I mentioned here in the slide uh, with carbon and pollution taxes and government incentives as well as overall adoption. So the, all these things will increase the cost of fossil fuel generation and decrease the cost of renewables, making this mix much more economically feasible in the future. Hi, my name is Victor Nguyen, and I shall be presenting mix two for our project. For our mix two, we want to characterize this mix as having a large base nuclear generation profile, as, as well as supporting renewable technologies, such as utility and domestic solar. 
onshore wind turbine, geothermal, and hydropower. We also modeled a battery storage system, which is based off the dim ion technology, in order to store excess energy generated and offset peak demand. From our table here, we can see that our total uh, capacity of our mix came out roughly to be 150,000 megawatts, and roughly 44% of it was accounted for by nuclear energy. For our mixed two results, it was found that our contaminant uh, was roughly 34% and our renewable penetration was roughly 7%. Uh, our renewable penetration percent was roughly low due to the fact that uh, nuclear energy accounted for most of the generation and it is not classified as re renewable. However, nuclear energy is classified as zero carbon and thus our goal of reaching 99% zero carbon penetration was achieved. We can also see in this graph here that the battery uh, model was used to offset some of the peak demand, which then in turn reduced the combined cycle generation as shown in this graph here. From this graph, you can see that the old natural gas power, power plant required was offset a small amount or completely from the discharge of the battery. For cost analysis of mix two, it was found that our total capital costs came out to be roughly $321.3 billion and our yearly OMAN fixed and variable costs came out to be roughly $11 billion a year. Our capital cost was expected due to the fact that nuclear energy has a relatively high capital cost as uh, shown in here compared to other uh, renewable technologies such as solar or wind. Our original idea for Mixture 3 incorporated an equal amount of geothermal, nuclear, solar, and wind and utilizes lithium battery storage. However, some research into geothermals showed that the ERCOT region has a geothermal capacity cap of 10,000 megawatts. Additionally, Texas currently has 33,133 megawatts worth of onshore wind with an additional 7,000 megawatts planned, so it would be pointless to downsize an existing infrastructure. In order to meet the energy demand, the mixture was modified to one that has an equal amount of nuclear, total wind, and total solar. The total installed capacity of this mixture is 184,474 megawatts, and incorporates an additional 10,000 megawatts of lithium ion battery storage. This mixture met the zero carbon requirement, totaling in at 99.02%. Additionally, our MATLAB program returned a renewable penetration of 22.91%, and the curtailment value was returned to 41.66%. Here we have the O&M costs that come with the current mixture. By far, the largest investment into any mixture is nuclear, totaling in at $8.162 billion for one year. Conversely, hydropower is the cheapest investment at around $14 million per year. The toll for this mixture comes out to $12.46 billion per year. So, after careful consideration, Mix 1 will actually be chosen to be utilized throughout the Earth coverage. And just to reiterate, Mix 1 is defined by a majority of wind and solar with additional supporting energy technologies like biogas, geothermal, and so on. While all three mixes were able to complete the goal of 99% carbon-free energy by 2045, Mix 1 definitely has some advantages. For instance, it has the largest renewable penetration out of the three mixes, and this is due to the large base of wind and solar for Mix 1, while Mix 2 and 3 have an equally large nuclear base. Also, the curtailed energy was smallest for Mix 1, and that is due to the large amount of storage that we are utilizing for, for Mix 1. The costs for all three were actually pretty similar. Uh, $325 billion for the capital cost and roughly $12 billion for the annual cost. But for mix two and three, these are based largely on speculation that the nuclear cost will fall. Uh, if the cost of nuclear stays at the current cost, which is around $6,000 to $7,000 per kilowatt, it could add a roughly $150 billion of additional capital. Additionally, if wind and solar continue to drop due to the vast amount of continued research, the cost could decrease even more. Uh, than the predicted values that we have. And not to dump on nuclear, but there is a large public perception issue with the technology. Uh, it would take a drastic change of opinions to be able to rely uh, this heavily on it. Now on the policy changes. As mentioned previously, ERCOT is separate from the rest of the United States energy grid. This provides some financial benefits as they are free of federal mandates, but this can also have some unexpected consequences if, for say, they have an energy shortage which just so happened to happen uh, this past February where a winter storm wiped out powered over 4 million households and businesses, some for more than a week. Government officials blamed frozen wind turbines and solar panels, but investigations that have since happened found frozen natural gas pipelines and lack of winter protection to be the true culprit. 
Joining the rest of the United States energy grid would allow ERCOT to borrow energy from outside sources if a situation like this were ever to come up again. A joining would also help the transition to renewable energy by increasing the likelihood of federal financial assistance. One of the key pillars of the United States new leadership was to steer the country towards more green energy, and they'd be much more likely to assist if everything was connected. A change of this magnitude would likely require a change in the elected officials. To rally the people, all you really have to do is point out to their high electric bills that they have right now, their, how their lights just got turned off for a week, and that a change is necessary. With damages climbing into the hundreds of billions of dollars, infrastructure would need to be rebuilt. Instead of rebuilding fossil fuel power plants, it just makes sense to build more green infrastructure since it's the future anyways. Uh, this report also proposes a large increase in energy storage, which would help prevent further issues like this from happening. Storing solar energy during the summer when it's more abundant uh, would allow it to be utilized in a pinch just, just like if a situation like this would ever come up again. Outside of current events, there are still many things that can be changed to help ease the transition to a more renewable energy infrastructure. A Texas, it currently does a pretty good job at implementing policies and incentives for green energy initiatives. They have about 118 different policies and incentives, which is the third most out of any state in the nation. But more targeted incentives towards groups with high energy burden would be beneficial. Instead of individual incentives that only people who could afford to install the technology could take advantage of, more community power would be emphasized. Uh, so the individual isn't paying the brunt of the bill. And lastly, uh, since renewable energy is such an integral part of our country's future, it should be an integral part of our education system. Uh, more knowledge and less misinformation would allow for it for the transition to go much easier and smooth. Uh, even if just the basics were taught immediately over the next 25 years, which is the timeline of this report, individuals would rise up and complete the tasks that are outlined in this presentation. Uh, so thank you very much for your time, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.